Welcome back to Mining of Massive Datasets. In the previous section, we uh, studied the MapReduce model uh, and how to solve some simple problems using MapReduce. In this section, we're going to go under the hood of a MapReduce system and understand how it actually works. Um, just to uh, refresh your memory, um, um, uh, a MapReduce system um, has, uh, a simple MapReduce process has three steps. In the uh, map step, you take a big uh, document, which is divided into chunks, um, and you run a map process on each chunk. Um, and the map process uh, goes through each record in that chunk, uh, and it outputs intermediate key value pairs uh, for each record in that, in that chunk. Um, in the uh, second set, uh, step, which is a group by step, um, you group by key. You, uh, you bring together um, all the values for, for the same key. Um, and in the third step, which is a reduce step, um, you apply a reducer to each uh, intermediate key value uh, pair set, uh, and you f create a final output. Now, here's a schematic of how it actually works in, uh, in, in a distributed system. Uh, the previous schematic uh, was how it worked in a, in a, in a centralized system. Uh, in a distributed system, you actually have multiple nodes, uh, and map and reduce tasks are running uh, in parallel on multiple nodes. Um, so um, the, uh, here, a few chunks of the file, uh, input file, uh, might be on, um, on node 1, a uh, few chunks on node 2, and a few chunks on node 3. And you have map tasks running on, on each of those nodes um, and, uh, and producing, uh, producing intermediate key value pairs on each of those nodes. Um, and once the, inter uh, once the uh, intermediate key value pairs are produced, um, the uh, underlying system, uh, the MapReduce system, uses a partitioning function, which is just a hash function. Um, so the, uh, the um, MapReduce system applies a hash function to each uh, intermediate key value. And the hash function will tell uh, the MapReduce system which reduce node to send that key value pair to. Right? This ensures that uh, all, the, all the, the same key values, whether they're in map task 1, 2, or 3, end up being sent to the same reduce task. Right? So in this case, uh, the key uh, K4, uh, regardless of where it started from, whether in 1, 2, or 3, always ends up at reduce task 1. And uh, the key K1 uh, always ends up at reduce task 2. Now, once, uh, once the reduce task has, uh, a reduce task has received uh, input, from all uh, from all the map tasks, uh, all the map tasks have completed. Then you can start the reduce tasks, uh, and uh, the, the reduce tasks' first job is is to sort um, its input uh, and group it together by key. Uh, and so in this case, uh, there are three values associated with the key uh, key K four. They're all grouped together, uh, and once that is done, the reduce task then invokes the reduce function, which is provided by the programmer um, on each. Um, each such uh, group uh, and creates the final output. Okay, so uh, remember the programmer provides two functions, map and reduce, and specifies the input file. Uh, the map reduce environment take, has to take care of a bunch of things. Uh, it takes care of partitioning the input data, uh, scheduling the program's execution on a set of machines, so figuring out where the map tasks run, where the reduce tasks run, and so on. Uh, it performs a, uh, the intermediate group by step. Uh, and while all this is going on, uh, some nodes may fail, um, and the environment makes sure that the uh, node failures are hidden from the, uh, from the program. Um, and finally, the uh, MapReduce environment also manages all the required intermachine communication. So we're going to uh, take a look at exactly how, what's, uh, what's going on in a little bit. So let's look at the data flow that's associated with, uh, with, with MapReduce. Um, now, the, uh, the input and the final output of a MapReduce program are stored on the distributed file system. Um, and uh, the scheduler tries to schedule the map task close to the physical storage location of the input data. Now, what that means um, is that recall the input uh, uh, data is, is a file, and the file is divided into chunks. And there are replicas of the chunks on different uh, chunk servers. The uh, MapReduce system try to schedule each map task on a chunk server that holds a copy of the corresponding chunk. So there's no actual copy, um, a data copy associated with the map step um, of the MapReduce program. Now, the intermediate results 
uh, are actually uh, not stored in the distributed file system, but stored in the local file system of the map and reduce workers. Um, what, what are intermediate results? Intermediate results, an intermediate result could be the output of a map step. Um, an intermediate result could be uh, something that, that's emitted uh, while, while in the process of computing a reduce. Now, why, why are such intermediate results not stored in the distributed file system? It turns out that there is um, uh, some overhead to storing data in the distributed file system. Uh, remember, there are multiple replicas of the data that need to be made, um, and so there's a lot of um, uh, copying uh, and network shuffling involved in, in storing new data in the distributed file system. So whenever possible, uh, intermediate results are actually stored in the local file system of the map and reduce workers instead of being stored in the distributed file system to avoid uh, more network traffic. And finally, um, I, as you'll see in future examples, uh, the output of a map reduce task is often the input to another map reduce task. Now the master node uh, takes care of all uh, the coordination aspects of a MapReduce job. Uh, the master node keeps, um, you know, associates a task status with each task. A task is either a map task or a reduced task, um, and each task has um, has a status flag, and the status flag can either be idle, in progress, or completed. Um, the master uh, schedules idle tasks whenever workers become available. Whenever there is a free uh, a node that is uh, th that's available for, for scheduling tasks, uh, the master goes through its queue of idle tasks and schedules an idle task on that on that worker. Um, when the when a map task completes, it sends the um, the the master the location and sizes of its uh, uh, the R intermediate files that it that it creates. Now, uh, why R intermediate files? There's one uh, intermediate file that's created for each reducer. Uh, because the data, the output of the mapper has to be shipped to each of the reducers depending on the on the key value, uh, and so there are R intermediate files, one for each reducer. So when the, when a map task completes, it uh, let it, it it stores the R intermediate files on its local file system, and it lets the master know what the names of those files are. Uh, the master pushes this inf information to the reducers. Once the reducers know that all the mappers uh, uh, map tasks are completed, then they copy the um, intermediate files from each of the map tasks, um, and then they can proceed with their work. Now the master also uh, periodically pings uh, the workers to detect whether a worker has failed. And if a worker has failed, the, the master has to do something, and we're going to see what that something is. If a map worker fails, then the, all the map tasks that were scheduled uh, on, that, uh, on that map worker may have failed. So the, uh, the tricky thing is that the output of a map task is written to the local file system of the, of the map worker. So if a map worker fails, then the node um, fails, uh, then all the intermediate output created by all the map tasks that have run on that worker are lost. Um, and so the, uh, what the master does is that it um, resets to idle the status of every task that was either completed or in progress on that worker, right? Um, and so all those tasks need to be eventually redone, and they will eventually be rescheduled on other workers in due course. If a reduced worker fails, on the other hand, uh, only the in-progress tasks are set to idle. The tasks that have actually been completed by the reduced worker don't need to be set to idle because the output of the reduced worker is the final output and it's written to the distributed file system and not to the local file system of the reduced worker. Since the output is written to the uh, distributed file system, uh, the output is not lost even if the reduced worker fails. So only in-progress tasks need to be set to idle uh, while completed tasks uh, don't need to be redone. Right, and so the and once again the uh, idle reduced tasks will be uh, restarted on other workers eventually. What happens if the master fails? If the master node fails, then uh, the map reduced ta task is aborted. The client is notified, and the client um, can then do something like restarting the map reduced task. So um, this is the one scenario where the task will have to be restarted from scratch because the master is typically not replicated uh, in the map reduced system. Now you might think that this is a big deal that uh, that uh, the, the master failure 
means that the, uh, the MapReduce task is aborted and then the task has to be restarted. But remember, node failures are actually rather rare. A node fails, uh, as you recall, once every three years or once every thousand days. Um, and the master is, is a single node, uh, and therefore the chance of a master failing is actually quite, um, you know, it, it, it's quite an uncommon occurrence. Uh, the, the, the problem that you have is that when you have multiple workers associated in, um, in a MapReduce task, it's much more likely that uh, one of many workers fails rather than the master failing. So the final question uh, to think about is how many map and how many reduced uh, jobs uh, do we need? Suppose um, you know. Suppose there are m map tasks and r reduced tasks. Um, our goal is to determine m and r. The, this is part of the input that's given to the uh, map reduced uh, system uh, to let it know how many tasks to, uh, tasks it needs to schedule. Um, the rule of thumb is to make m much larger than the number of uh, nodes in the cluster. You might think that it's sufficient to have one map task per node in the cluster, but in fact. It, the, the rule of thumb is to have one map task per DFS chunk. And the reason for this is simple. Imagine that there is one map task per node in the cluster, and during um, you know during processing, uh, the node fails. If a node fails, then that map task needs to be uh, rescheduled on another node uh, in, in the cluster when it becomes available. Now, if, so since all the other nodes are processing. Uh, you know, uh, one of the map tasks has to, uh, uh, one of those nodes has to complete uh, before this map task can be uh, scheduled on that node. And so the entire um, uh, computation is slowed down um, by the time it takes to, com you know, complete this map task, the failed, uh, redo the failed map task. So if instead of one map task on a given node, there are many small map tasks on a given node, and that node fails, then those map tasks can then be spread across all the available nodes, uh, and so the entire task will complete much faster. On the other hand, the number of reducers R is usually smaller than uh, M, uh, and is usually even smaller than the total number of nodes in the system. Uh, and this is because the uh, the output file uh, is um, spread across um, spread across R nodes, where R is the number of reducers. Um, and if um, it's usually convenient to have the output. Um, is spread across a small number of nodes rather than across a large number of nodes. Um, and so usually R is set to a smaller value than M.